What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the latest episode of the Sling and Lead Live Show. I, of course, am your host, TJ, the Lead Sling and Ginger. Joining me, as always, is my lovable, always adorable, ready for radio co host, Kent Howard of Green Mountain Defense. Kent, what's new, brother? Can you hear me, Kent? He's muted. Yep, still muted. He's working against himself here. Yeah, just a little bit. Okay. We'll come back to you, Kent. <laughs> also joining me tonight uh, is a very special guest, uh, the uh, chief instructor and owner of the Modern Samurai Project, Scott Jedi Jedlinski. Scott, welcome to the show. I am excited to have you, sir. Hello. How are you? I'm fantastic. Kent, do we got you back now? Nope, we lost Kent again. This guy. Yeah, I tell you, man. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we lost him for some reason. All right. Can't keep troubleshooting, man. Uh, if you have to jump out, jump back in. Uh, yeah. But uh, Scott, uh, while we've got you here, uh, now naturally on this show, we do have a lot of new shooters, uh, new people new to the firearms industry. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, and what the Modern Samurai Project is all about? Sure. Uh, so again, like you said, uh, my name is Scott Jedlinski. Uh, my nickname is Jedi because I'm half Korean and half Polish that slanted eyes uh, kind of confuse people with the Polish last name. So my nickname is Jedi because no one can pronounce my last name. Uh, I run Modern Samurai Project, uh, which is a training company. Uh, I specialize in AIWB classes and red dot pistol classes. Uh, as far as my background goes, uh, I'm very clear about staying in my lane, non mill non-LE. Uh, I'm a lifelong martial artist. One of the reasons why I say that is because it has a very heavy influence in my classes where I teach body mechanics and the way the body works, uh, which is a big benefit in teaching people to be more efficient. And because efficiency is the key in finding the true benefits on a red dot pistol and AIWB uh, for that matter. That's fantastic. So uh, I do want to get, uh, so naturally this conversation is going to be a lot about your tutelage and your experience and expertise uh, yep. with regards to AIWB uh, appendix inside the waistband for the folks watching at home. Uh, and of course, uh, a focus on red dot pistol employment on a, on a handgun. Uh, but I do want to talk about your, your martial arts a little bit. Uh, so what, what uh, discipline do you ascribe to and uh, how, how long have you been doing that? Uh, so I think I started in Taekwondo when I was eight or something like that, you know, being half Korean, you do Taekwondo, otherwise you get disowned. Right. And, uh, so start off with that. Uh, I'm an air force kid, right? So that's, you know, dad was stationed in Korea during the Vietnam where I met my mom. They had the biggest Asian ever being me. Uh, <laughs> and it, it's always fun. I'm gonna, I'll go ahead and say that everybody. So I'm like six, two and a half, 280 pounds. Uh, everybody's very uh, confused when they first meet me because I'm so big. Anyway, so it went from uh, Taekwondo and then to various things, karate, uh, Muay Thai, and a little bit of wrestling through my high school years. Uh, and then in 1995, I discovered Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Uh, and have been doing that ever since, even though I took a 12 year hiatus as my career, my day job is I'm a mortgage banker. Um, but that's quickly falling by the wayside with my teaching schedule. Um, so yeah, uh, so the last up the year it's Brazilian, been Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Most of the body mechanics in which I teach, uh, I have learned from that discipline. So actually that brings up, so I was just taking a note on this and that was honestly why I was leading us down that path uh, mm -hmm. was because uh, I was curious what, what types of cross references and benefits have you gotten in your shooting discipline and skill set with, and obviously the way you teach from your martial arts background. So sure. uh, can you talk uh, about that a little bit? So, so a couple of main things, right? Um, uh, you say you have a lot of new, you know, uh, people that are, are novices or new to the shooting, you know, uh, disciplines and things of that nature. Uh, 
unlike some beliefs, right, where especially men believe because they are men uh, and they are endowed with, you know, what we are endowed with, that they know how to do a couple of things. One of them is shooting from birth, right? And uh, or they had the uncle who was in Vietnam, who was a Marine, or they've been hunting deer since they were a kid and yada, yada. The thing you learn from jujitsu is uh, there is a technique to everything. There is a concept in body mechanics to everything. Uh, and then once you learn that technique and that concept, you drill it to become efficient and then you pick up speed, right? Uh, and then once you learn that, you drill and you drill and then you drill again. And then once you have mastered it in a drilling type of scenario, then you pressure test it in what we call the role, right? Sparring. Right. Where you're basically, you know, you are sparring uh, against a unwilling opponent or an uncooperative opponent who is trying to submit you as well right? Because that is the true way to test if your technique is solid or not. Uh, so learning it from that, people ask me all the time, dude, how'd you get so good so quick? How'd you explode onto the, on the uh, training scene? Yada, yada, yada. Really with that methodology, right? Uh, and also understanding the body works the way the body works, right? Um, what I, here's what I say. The laws of physics and kinesiology do not change from sport to sport, from physical activity to physical activity, until we pick up a firearm, especially a pistol, and we throw all that stuff out the window, right? So if we're going to get into a fist fight, we fight like this. But if we're going to shoot people with a pistol, then we stand sideways and do weird kinds of stuff, right? Or if we're fighting like this and then we pick up a pistol, now we fight like this, right? Incorrect. I don't care what you think. I don't care what your drill sergeant taught you. The body works the way the body works. Efficiency and structure over strength is what is the key to be efficient. And when you're efficient, you'll become faster. So that is what I learned from jujitsu, and it's proved uh, it, it's proved uh, against many metrics. I, I'll tell you what, that, everything you just said, I'm glad we're recording this because that belongs on a damn T-shirt. <laughs> That's fantastic, uh, Kent. Do we got you back now, buddy? Oh yeah, I've been back for a minute. I just didn't want to uh, stop the flow. Oh, there we go. Okay, cool. No, really, I was making small talk uh, with our guest while we. Uh, <laughs> Well, we were getting you back on. So real quick, uh, Kent, tell everybody what you got going on, man. Oh, I'm good. Just trying to make beginner shooters into less beginner shooters one evening at the range at a time. That's my life. Um, but for those for those of you who may or may not have known, I've had the privilege of hosting Scott up here at uh, West Shore Sportsman's Club in Lewisburg, PA. We'll be doing that again Mother's Day weekend 2020. Um but I will refrain from every time Scott says something, piping my head up and going, I remember that. Um, <laughs> well, but I think it's good feedback because you've been through it, it right? I mean, I, I've got some confirmation bias going on. So. Yeah. So for, for me, I think, I think the thing that stood out, TJ, you went down the martial arts path. Um, the thing that stood out to me about Scott wasn't actually the martial arts so much as his ability to communicate to various groups of people. And Scott and I have this a little bit in common in that we have a professional sales background for a day job. Um, the ability to communicate to a super Delta Neil Ranger operator guy one minute, and then a dude like me who has a professional day job for a living the next minute is something that not all these guys have. And I just wanted to talk to you, Scott, a little bit about where your teaching methodology came from as far as the way you communicate and how you break things down for folks? Uh, yeah, great question. And this often um, surprises people. Uh, they want to, because, you know, I've, I, I've taken a lot of, you know, slash tactical self-defense classes, yada, yada, yada. Uh, my main teaching style comes from my Brazilian jiu-jitsu professor, Tony Passos. Um, he is amazing at watching 
people explaining concepts, right? So, so not all, but a lot of, you know, they, you go to some jujitsu schools and they teach you technique. Uh, there's like two or three techniques in a night. None of them have anything to do with each, with, with each other. And they just let you go and then you roll, right? The way he does his uh, program is that one technique builds on the next technique, builds on the next technique. And he explains it in a way of a concept, right? So that regardless that if you are in guard or if you're in mount or side position, if you are employing this concept, it will work regardless of the position. I find firearms to be the same thing, right? Um, in that if we have the proper concept employed, uh, anybody can do it. Anybody can do it. It doesn't matter if you were that high-speed operator you were talking about. It doesn't matter if it's the accountant, the gynecologist, uh, or that kindergarten school teacher. You employ the concept, the efficiency will come through, and the, and the performance based on a metric uh, will be applied, and you'll be amazed at the results. Awesome. That was, uh, that was where I was leading. So I think... I think the teaching style differential is something that really appealed to me um, from the get-go because it's it's more it's more in tune with the way I I think because I need it to I need there to be a reason for what we're doing. I don't just need a bunch of supervised uh, practice. I need help and understanding and why why do we put the pinky where we put the pinky? Why do we manage recoil the way we do? Why why why? Because mm -hmm. that's how my brain works. Um, yep. That said, so far we've talked about you as a gun instructor overall, but we haven't really talked about the intricacies of the red dot. Uh, so it's 2019. Why are we putting red dots on pistols? What are we doing this for? Uh, you know, it all gets down to efficiency, right? One focal plane is always easier. They're more, more efficient than three focal planes. Uh, three focal planes work just like your manual transmission in your car works. It might even be very fun. And if you master it, you can have a high level of driving, just like you can have a high level of shooting. The bottom line is, is I don't care who you are, if you say that driving a manual transition is easier than an automatic transition, uh, you're lying. You're yeah, lying. It, it is the anti-theft device of the, the new millennium, so. Right, yeah, yeah, you're, <laughs> right, exactly, you're lying. <laughs> So that, that said, uh, transitioning uh, to an automatic transition, transmission is always easier in a car. So is one focal plane shooting in which the dot delivers. Uh, the the uh, resistance to the dot uh, can be similar to anybody who, you know, grew up driving a manual transmission. When you have to do all these things, clutch gas pedal you know shifting gears all these things and now you just have to worry about gas pedal it feels a little weird and different because you're doing much less to get that efficiency and you don't like that uh, i always laugh because the person that uh one of my buddies who was older than me was trying to teach me how to drive an automatic transmission he used both feet one on the gas and one on the on the uh brake Right. And I think that's what people are doing with iron sights as they transition to the uh, red dot. Just do things as you will always do things. Right. Uh, and there's some mechanical differences. And that's why it make, it make uh, the difficulty of switching can be a little bit. But all you got to do is go to one class from a vetted instructor who knows what he's talking about. So. Awesome. Awesome. So. Let's talk a little bit about zero distance. I've heard it said, uh, P.S., if you're not listening to Scott on his podcast, the uh, MSP podcast or the Get Better podcast, whatever he's talking about, you need to, you need to get over there and do that. But on your show, I've, I've heard you say that the 25 versus the 10-yard zero is the new uh, 9 versus 45 of the Internet. So for our little corner of the world that hasn't heard this yet, you want to just fix that right quick? 10 versus yeah. 45. Sure, sure. So you have a 10 yard zero and you have a 25 yard zero, right? And let me be very clear. I don't care. I really don't care. But I think what you need to do is you need to understand uh, the access 
uh, of ranges and equipment that different people have and what you're trying to accomplish, right? If we can, so there's two types of people that shoot red dots, right? Those that have to, because their eyesight is not as strong as they want it to be, mm -hmm. right? And then there are people whose eyesight is very good, but they see the benefits of one focal plane shooting, right? So with the, the overwhelming majority is the first group right um that that flock to the red dot because of their vision okay asking that person to zero at 25 yards is a tall task right uh so if you can't see a one inch square or circle at 10 yards you might not want to be shooting or get your prescription updated right uh, but that same person shooting out to 25 yards, man, a B8, the black, you know, the uh, the nine ring on a B8, it, it can just look like a big blob. And asking them to zero at those distances uh, might be a tall order and a tall order which may not serve their purposes, depending on what they're trying to accomplish. Right. Um, so let's talk about when it's good, uh, which one's. Let's talk about which each application is good, the pros and cons of each, right? So let's start off with the 10 yard zero. What are the pro, uh, the pros of a 10 yard, of a 10 yard zero? Uh, first of all, most people with bad vision or good vision can see like a one inch square or the red bullseye on a shoot and see target at 10 yards, right? I think we can agree to that, right? Yep. I think we can also agree that offhand, right, um, is easier to set up if your range is it is not at least 10 yards, you don't have a range, <laughs> right? right? Okay, right. Uh, and it should be suspect while you're even shooting there. Uh, and shooting a one inch target at 10 yards requires a good to high level of marksmanship. We can agree to that. Oh yeah. So if you if, if that if it encompasses all that, how does that translate, right? How does a one inch square, you know, like mine in my class, I try and get you to do three rounds touching inside or whatnot, a one inch square at ten yards. How does that translate at twenty five yards? Well, if you put the dot on what you estimate to be the bottom of the 10 ring on a B8. You'll be doing 10s, 10 ring and X ring all day long, right? Cool. And on a five and a half inch circle, which is, which is the black on a B8, um, to me, that is perfectly acceptable, right? Um, and then, you know, there's different drop measurements out there based on, you know, what grain of nine millimeter you're shooting. Most of them can agree that a 10 yard zero equals to a 50 yard zero. Right. Uh, and then the applications of shooting even closer, you know, from 10 yards to seven to five to three. Uh, if you're trying to put hole in hole, for example, if you're shooting dot torture with a two inch circle. Right at three yards, you put that dot on the top of the circle and you're busting out the middle of the circle, right? Um, where you have to put the holdover is much higher with a 25 yard zero. Uh, so, look, you need to do what your practical level uh, of use is going to be. If that's competition, USPSA and IDPA rarely are targets further out than 15 yards. Right. The hardest shot you're going to find out there is a 50 yard zero. Well, just know your hold unders or hold overs. Right. And you're still going to have to do the same with 25 yards. Right. If your life is about shooting B eights, right, because you are deathly afraid that you're going to be attacked in the middle of the night by a five <laughs> and a half inch black circle at 25 yards, bro, then zero with 25 yards if you have those um if you have those resources 
let's talk about the resources of a 25 zero, 25 yard zero. And this is the kind of thing like I've talked to proponents of the 25 yard zero and I've told them you guys need to do videos on that because people don't understand that. Okay. For a 25 yard zero, they are putting a target, right? Usually a B eight at eye level or muzzle and eye level. They are setting up a prop with bags and fully rested on that so that their trigger finger and all that other stuff cannot influence the movement of the gun. And then they are taking their all day to go ahead and do that. If you have those resources, knock yourself out. Please, by all means, knock yourself out. Me, I don't have the patience for that. Right? Number one. Number two, I don't have the resources. I mean, I do. I, if I wanted to, I could have the resources, right? But in order for me to find the perfect height, uh, rest, and bags, and all this stuff, lug that from my car to my range and set all that stuff up, for what? So that I can shoot a 100 B8, 100 scored B8 all the time versus... A 96 or a 97 I don't I don't see the utility in that that's right. me though right that's me based on what my expectations are if anything less than a 100 b8 right and for the shooters out there 100 b8 is a b8 at 25 yards you scored a hundred uh, 10 rounds uh, equals a hundred if you hit them all in the tang or the X ring if that's important to you knock yourself out it is not that critical to me. Not that so, critical to so, me. So let me ask you this. Let, let me ask you this, Jedi. Mm -hmm. uh, with that being said, and you, you went through, I'm, I'm glad you touched on that with regards to the zeroing process, you know, on a, on a rest with a bag, you know, perfect height distance. So exactly, yeah. let me, let me ask you this. While I can appreciate the utility of that, you know, if you want to be a bullseye shooter and just shoot competition, that's great. Um, me personally, and I know Kent's kind of the same way, we use competition to kind of hone our and test our self-defense skills. So we like to be a little bit more self-defense oriented. So with that being said, would you argue that zeroing in an unsupported position is more beneficial or more, I, I guess for lack of a better term, credible than doing a completely supported, you know, perfect environment zero at any distance uh just because at least from my experience i've i've seen that by zero in the dot in an unsupported fashion you're almost kind of zeroing it to not just the gun but to your shooting style yeah great question there and um i'm going to be careful with my answer on that right because it depends on the shooter right, right. if you have somebody like my buddy bill blowers of tap rack tactical right who's trigger press is uh near perfect right he does it just in case he had too little or too much caffeine okay so he isolates the skill but could he do it offhand sure he could but he has the resources and the perfect setup to make uh or setup to make his 25 yard zero as effortless as my 10 yard zero does that make sense no, it does. It does. Right? Yeah. Um, for your shooter who can't shoot at 25 yards uh, and they have some mechanical issues uh, going on with their trigger, their grip, their trigger press, all those other things, I think a mechanical zero can help, but it's really not going to. Right? Mm -hmm. Um and the thing of hitting if you do a sh if you do 10 shots at 25 yards and you completely shank uh one and it's in the seven ring or even worse right at 25 yards you're not going to be able to see that shank at 10 yards you will be able to so i would say for people trying to graduate to that higher level technique of the straight back trigger press and being able to call your shots I think a 10 yard zero is a good is a good place to start. Uh, and then there's the always the argument of, 
well, once I had the 10 yard zero mastered, should I then graduate to the 25? I don't know. Maybe. Uh, if, Maybe. if you, if you wanna, <laughs> if you wanna, yeah, I guess, yeah. but I will tell you that, uh, shooting one inch squares at 10 yards translates really, really well to shooting at 25 yards, you know? Right. I mean? Yeah, uh, absolutely. So something and, to think and, about and I think, and I think you covered that topic pretty well. I mean, you said it right up, right off the bat. It doesn't really matter what your zero is going to be. You are responsible for knowing your holdovers, your hold unders for the target you're engaging, depending on the zero that you've chosen. Yep. Right. Yep. yep. So, uh, can so I one, can I say one more thing about that? No, if you don't no mind? By, all, by all means, man. Guys, if you're trying to pick on a zero, try all of them, right? right. Please, 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 please stop making your decisions based on some cool guy told you it, right? Oh, Jedi said 10 yard zero. It's, it's gospel. No, it's not. No, it's not. Or so-and-so high-speed guy said 25, so it's gospel. Uh, no, it's not. You need to figure out by trying both of them which one is best for you. Do you think I've settled on a 10-yard zero because I've never tried a 25? No, man. I have a gun zero to 25 right now, right? I mean, one of the advantages of being the red dot guy is I have a lot of them, right? I've got one zero to 25 yards right now. I can find no appreciable difference for the amount of effort that needs to be put in in a 10 versus 25 yard zero as long as uh, your acceptable level of accuracy at 10 is specific enough, okay? And by that I mean, your, if you're trying to zero at 10 yards by the X ring on a B8, which is 1.75 inches, you're doing it wrong. 1.75 inches at 10 yards is not a zero. It's a coordinate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This was uh, this was something that was apparent in class with you. Um, I think some guys were I think some guys were surprised to be shooting at that small of a uh, zero target so early in class. Dudes come to a Jedi class ready to start burning down the bill drills and you're like, all right, yo, here's a one inch square. Can you hit that? Oh, you can't. Okay. Well, let's fix that. Or, yeah. or better yet. I even demo the pace at which I want you to do it. Which mm. is, <sighs> yep. Press, press, press. Right. And they do three rounds and they're like, pop, pop, pop. I'm like, where the, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> where did yep. that come from? Yep. You, you were doing you were demonstrating in slow motion expectation is real time <laughs> yeah exactly exactly now you know what i'll tell you what that's if i could pass anything on to the people that might stumble across this channel and our dozens of followers and fans um several dozen yeah several dozen right, we'll, we'll be fair <laughs> um no it you hit on another great point man it's don't be afraid to go and ask the question well what if if you're on the range and you're like, okay, well, so-and-so said 10 yards is the zero. Well, what if I set it at 15? What if I set it at 17 and a half, right? Mm -hmm. As long as you're being safe, there's no wrong with experimentation with firearms and stuff like that. Hell, that's how we typically find new doctrine and training standards. People taking the time to say, what if, and then trying it and saying, hey, holy crap, this actually works. You know? Awesome. Somebody, somebody somewhere said, what if we zero at 10 versus what if we zero at 25? Yep. And then and look what it turned into. It's, you know, the, the next great nine versus 45 debate is Kent, you said so eloquently. Eloquently, uh, yeah. So let's slay some more sacred cows, Jedi. You want to slay another sacred cow? Sure. Competition versus tactical shooting. And go. Uh, well, I mean, that's actually, I mean, that's a, that's, that's not a cow. That's a herd. <laughs> um, Dude, more t-shirts. You, you just keep so, 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 so let me start this off with the story. The first time I heard competition will get you killed in the streets 
was actually not in reference to shooting. It was in reference to uh, jujitsu uh, and martial arts as a whole, right? Uh, people hold on to certain things, and when their skills are lacking, uh, they make excuses, okay? Uh, it is the same thing when a, only a defensive martial artist – you know, like when the UFC first happened and Hoist Gracie went in there in 93 and destroyed all of your classic martial arts people. Right. They immediately said, well, that's competition. It's not, you know, real. Bro, they could do everything but eye gouge and bite. What are you talking about? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, and there's two types of people, two types of people that go, oh, I need to, my, there's a hole in my uh, skills and there's all, you know, I've got the striking, I've got the kicking, but if someone takes me to the ground, oh crap. Right? You've got you to gotta be willing to admit when you suck. Yeah. And, and that was always my realization, you know, uh, doing a little wrestling in high school and stuff like that. Here's the deal, guys. You want to, let's get to the core of it, right? Who does nobody mess with in high school? Um, I was a wrestler in high school. People right. mess with me all the time, but that's because I'm too nice. Okay, well, that's because you're too nice, right? But for the most part, as a group, right? Oh, yeah, nobody, nobody messes with the wrestling team. Right. The football team, whatever. Who cares, right? Basketball, so whatever, unless they're going to go run around the you know uh, court all the time. Cross country, whatever. Baseball, not even a real sport. Uh, I said that out loud, didn't I? No, I was no. a baseball, I was a baseball you know player all the way through. Hey, anything yeah. that takes the athleticism, the athleticism of a bunch of stepfathers, yeah, that, yeah. Hey, that's a sport right there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> anyway, uh, that said, the people that nobody ever mess with, man, nobody mess with the wrestlers because they fight every single day. And when I saw, you know, when I first saw the UFC, I was like, yeah, man, that's it. And then there's other people that make excuses that, well, that's just competition. There's falsified rules. Like, all of a sudden, I can beat you with rules. So then you think I can't beat you without rules? Makes zero sense, right? Amen. And it's the, yeah, it's the same thing with competition. Uh, look at all of the high-level national instructors out there. Mike Pannone, uh, Pat McNamara, uh, Frank Proctor. Um, you know, and the list goes on Mike Green. Um, the list goes on and on Kyle Lamb, on and on. All these people competed, right? They all competed because all they did was they isolated their skills, right? And they applied it to a metric across many people to get better. Uh, why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you do that, right? I always laugh when people go, my competition, blah, blah, blah. Watch me do this drill. Bro, the drill's on an Ipsic target. Where do you think that comes from? Right. Right? Yeah. Or that, that stuff will get you blah, blah, blah. Bro, you shoot a red dot. Where do you think that came from? Not not to mention a, a lot of the optics or uh, iron sights that people upgrade to resemble and mimic red dots. Well, all that stuff came from fiber optic sites all came from competition. Right. Right. Now, that being said, right, is which is the alpha, which is the omega? I'm saying it's not. I'm saying it's a circle. Right. Okay. Uh, a, a, as I have said to, uh, you know, like you mentioned my podcast, so I'll, I'll had BJ. No, I had BJ Norris on there. Right. Who is the king of speed. But people also don't realize that he is a national world champion IEPA as well with a that requires a high, high level of accuracy, as does Speed Challenge, which he's a world champion in, right? And one of the things that we always make fun of is, you know, you have your tactical Timmies out there where, who don't compete, everything, you know, they take everything way too serious. And then on the other hand, you have my gamer friends who don't take anything serious. There's a, there's a middle ground there, right, to take from both and improve overall. Awesome. Uh, yep. So that's, that's, so, that's how I feel about that. So that said, if I could just throw a quick follow up at you, mm -hmm. are there things from competition? And, you know, spoiler alert, I think I know what you're going to say, but is there stuff from competition 
that is suboptimal for use in the streets, if you will? Is, is there stuff that can well, bad habits? So, that you so let's talk. Let, so suboptimal, I don't think is the correct word. Let's say non-applicable. Fair. Okay. Your your five pound two thousand eleven in a non covered race holster is not applicable to self defense. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Oh yeah. Uh, in limit, right? So that's an open gun. In limited, um, is your you know uh, super again super heavy two thousand eleven in that race holster can you carry that without an inner and an outer belt and a stiff holster with a you know still a stiff attachment can you carry that no but that's an equipment thing are the skills applicable to self-defense uh sure they are sure they are um because they help you get bigger headlights right and, and what do i mean by that People often say that if you start missing, you should slow down because you're getting beyond your headlights. Slow down to get your hits, right? Right. What I say is don't slow down, get bigger headlights, right? Uh, for example, we talked about physical activities, right, before the laws of physics and geology. If I, were to, if I were to say, if you were to ask me, hey, Scott, I want to get to a 300-pound bench press, and I said, cool, man, all you got to do is do 100-pound bench presses slowly and smoothly 10,000 times. You would laugh at me. Yep. You would laugh at me, right? If, if a race car driver said, hey, man, I need, I need an average speed of 180 miles per hour on this oval track. How do I get there? And I said, cool, bro. Drive 65 miles an hour slowly and smoothly and the speed will come. That person will laugh at me. But for some reason in, in the shooting disciplines, right, it has become okay to say, do it slow and smooth and speed will just come. Right. My, my question is, how's it come? FedEx? <laughs> yes. How's it, yeah. how's it how does it just appear? Because in every other physical activity or sport I've ever done, I've had to work, push my point, push my skill level to the point of failure. Then my CNS and my perception, uh, metaphor, uh, metaphorically saying, my headlights have opened up and gotten bigger. And then where I was pushing before is now my new norm. So are you telling me that the pew pew stork is not just going to deliver me the awesome shooting baby one day? Or Man, find me that guy where that happened. Right? It, it's the skill stork. It's yeah. skill stork. Find, just going to drop a either. bundle of skill right down your chimney for you. I, I'm still waiting for that guy. Right. right. So say, I, this is exactly how that happened. And when I find that guy, I'm like, awesome. Let's go shoot my standards. Yeah, Which so uh, are something else, by the way. Oh yeah, because we're going to get into that here in a second. But that's gonna that uh, this actually segues into one of my next questions. Are there good drills? So it's talk, talking about the you know ten thousand reps of a hundred pounds type stuff. Are there good drills that a novice shooter can start with to hammer home those foundational skills that you see mastered by other shooters? Yeah, so there's a there's a progression of drills, right? I will tell you, and it depends on what you want, okay? If at the very beginning you're talking about trigger control, uh, you're talking about, you know, a straight back press to the rear, uh, I think dot torture, right, uh, made, uh, made famous by Todd Lewis Green on pistol form, everybody should be doing that. If you are a... If you are a victim of the low left syndrome, right, uh, start shooting dot torture and you will learn, even at three yards, amazing things uh, about your level of accuracy, right, and, and how to diagnose that stuff and seeing things uh, within your sight package, right? So that's kind of the very beginning, right? Uh, moving beyond that, once you've got that down, uh, you know, I'm 
I'm biased because I have a fast coin, but the fast drill is uh, an amazing test on sedentary uh, gun handling uh, skills. The, the ability to draw quickly, to modulate a refined sight picture in a three by five card, slide lock reload, and then letting it go into four rounds in an eight inch circle. Yeah, so uh, Jedi, real quick, can you explain for those that don't know exactly what the fast drill is? Yeah, sure. So uh, created by Todd Lewis Green, God rest his soul, now taken over by Ernest Langdon of Langdon Tactical, right? So uh, the story behind that is that if you do it in front of Ernest Langdon, um, you know, uh, routinely in his class, uh, and you do it twice in a row, you get a fast coin, right? There are only 18 fast coins out there. I am recipient number 15. And I am the only one that has done it with a red dot, right? So the drill is at seven yards on, uh, on a target with a three by five card in the head box at an eight inch circle center mass. You draw from concealment, right? Or uh, in order to keep it flat, a uh, dual retention holster, an ALS SLS combo. Um, uh, you draw two rounds in the three by five at the head, slide lock reload four rounds in the eight inch circle you need to do it in 499 seconds or less twice in front of Ernest, which is usually in front of 19 other people in his class uh so that's that right uh, i think it's a great test um i think other great tests out there uh is you know there's the uh there's ken hackathorn's 10 and 10 right I would add in a draw where he does it from high ready. Uh, I would add in a draw, 10 rounds, 10 seconds, 90 or better. Uh, and then shooting B8s, you know, you have Kyle DeFore's test, uh, which again is at high ready. I would tell you to do it from a draw where it is uh, 90 or better. So 10 rounds, B8, 25 yards, uh, 10 rounds, 90 or better, 20 seconds or better. I honestly think that if you can get those under your belt, you are on your way to pistol mastery, right? And then there's a whole bunch of other things that are next level stuff. So, but that's, that list is just way too long to list. So. Awesome. So we've talked, uh, we've talked drills. We've talked zero. Uh, we've talked competition versus tactical. What about, um, some of these things I, I had on my on my docket to bring up to you uh training conferences because it's something you're participating in now and i kind of wanted to give you an opportunity to expound on a little bit what i mean of course is stuff like uh, shooter symposium uh stuff like range master mm -hmm. the traditional format is you pay somebody like scott 500 bucks let's say for a weekend um you spend 16 hours with that one instructor this is not entirely a new concept. Range Master's been doing it for a while, but you've you've had the opportunity to participate, and I believe will be in the future, in some of these like four-hour block type classes at some of these regional training events. Yep. And I wanted to make sure you got an opportunity to expound on some of that. Um, expound in what way? The, do I dig them? How well, do just, I dig them? Or just what? Which um, which ones? You're going to Range Master. You're going to Symposium. I, in my opinion, it's yeah, there's, so there's this, there's, there's like uh, a couple of them out there, right? So, you know, the, the first one I had the uh, honor of being part of was Shooter Symposium out of Eagle Lake, Te Eagle Lake Texas, uh, outside of Houston, um, uh, at the Ranch, Texas, uh, put on by Matt Shockey. Uh, super honored to be in, in, in the uh, lineup of instructors out there. Do I enjoy it? Yeah, man, I enjoy it. Shockey does a great job, takes care of everything for us. We literally show up, teach, drink, eat meat, and then teach, and then drink, and then eat meat, right? Uh, so it's a, it, it's a great thing. As far as students go, uh, I think it is that next level of where most classes you go, you take your instruction, maybe you have a, a training day one dinner, uh, and that's about it, 
right? And maybe some social media interaction after that. This one, you really get to hang out with the instructors afterwards. You get to see in, instructors interact with other instructors and you get the, the mixture, right? Of how people say different things. They may say different things, but it is explaining the same concept from different angles, right? Or you may find out two instructors completely disagree about something and you gain a higher knowledge of why this person on the spectrum, it, it works for them based on a metric. And then this person does this thing, which is the complete opposite, but it still works based on that metric, right? And you get to understand and learn different teaching styles. I will tell you for me, uh, it has been an incredible boon in marketing, not just to have my name up there with other well-known individuals, but people got a taste of what I teach and then they come back for a two day class, right? Uh, the TACCON thing, again, that kind of hit me by surprise. Uh, you know, I think I have some people like um, Spencer Keepers, Brian Hill, uh, Wayne and Wayne Dobbs. Uh, and John Johnston to thank for, you know, kind of bending uh, Tom Gibbons ear to have me in there, right? Because I've never taken a class from Tom. Tom and I are Facebook friends, you know, uh, our, wi our wives are like best Facebook friends, right? Since I think they're almost carbon copies of each other. Uh, good looking blonde, blue eyed ladies. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so it's an extreme honor to be invited for that and having not taken anything from Tom before. Um, and that's going to be a good time, man. That's, uh, that's going to be a good time to kind of uh, juxtapose my teaching versus other teaching. And I'm looking forward to um, taking some classes while I'm out there as well in those four hour blocks. Uh, and there's some other ones. There's going to be in Oklahoma one that my buddy uh mike is putting on uh next year be looking for that announcement soon so yeah very cool yeah it's nice for guys to be able to get that appetizer sampler of a couple different things and then figure out what's worth going back to so yep. uh for those for those that uh, may not know um you're relatively new at least on the training scene and your newness is not without success and you've obviously put in a lot of work, a lot of time and a lot of energy in competition shooting and in shooting overall to get where you've gotten. That being said, give me a couple really good habits of successful shooters like yourself, uh, things that you know that guys and girls do that tend to be the better shooters and what are, what are their good habits that you see that our audience and ourselves honestly could, re could replicate? Yeah, great question. Um, listen to everybody. Do not take what they're saying as gospel. I don't care who it is. I don't care if it's your uncle that was in the Marines in Vietnam. I don't care if it was a world multi-time world champion uh, USPSA shooter. I don't care if he was Deb Grew or Delta or or you know a green beret in the groups i don't care T listen to what every single one of them says put it against your own barometer of empirical experience and put it to a metric what do i mean put it to a metric what is there has to be a measurement of performance right um and and what is that so this person says to do this, right? And it shaves 0.1 off your draw. Well, that's not the end all be all. Don't discount someone else that has a different technique. Give it a try. What else are you doing, right? And see if that shaves a second off your draw, number one. Number two, related to that, never be a slave to your favorite instructor. Okay. Because every good instructor wants you to grow beyond them. And if they don't, they're not a good instructor. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so even if you, you may disagree with a mentor 
right? But if the metric says, well, he told me to do it this way, and in this drill, I'm doing it in four seconds versus this Instagram Yahoo. I'm not talking about myself, right? I'm not a Yahoo. But this Instagram Yahoo tells me to do it this way, and I'm just as accurate, but I'm doing it in two seconds. But my former instructor says that guy's a Yahoo. Who cares? Who cares? The, the information a person give, gives is not necessarily beholden to the character of that person. Does that make sense? Absolutely, yeah. I, I, no, I, I think it, yeah, I think that makes perfect sense. And I would even say that the mark of a good student is someone who takes the tutelage of a, a value, valued instructor and through the course of their own mastery of that art form, as they get better and discover new ways and improved ways of doing things would go back to that instructor and say, Hey man, I, I know you taught us this way and I was seeing X as a result, but I found this other way just from watching other people and I get Y, which is, you know, no disrespect, but superior to the outcome that I was getting the way you taught it. I mean, if anything, that instructor taking that knowledge can then be a good vessel to carry that refined practice elsewhere. Absolutely. You know, so there, there, and a lot of people talk about, you know, what is the mark of a good instructor? I also ask that's a, you know, that's a, or I also bring up, that's a double-edged sword. What's the mark of a good student? Yeah. Right. There you go. You, know, you, you yeah. can have the greatest instructor on the planet. If you're a bad student, you, you're not going to get it nearly as much out of it as you would otherwise. Yeah. We need not to get lost in the cult of personality. Yeah, and that's that's easy for someone to do, especially someone who's had. I remember my first couple of classes, right? And they were the best classes ever. Yep. But but what's your sample size? What are you comparing it to? My first car was also the best car ever. Guess what? Bro, my my Buick Skylark was the <laughs> amazing thing on the <laughs> on the earth. Right. Um, for sure. all, all the millennials are going. What's a Buick Skylark? Yeah, yeah. Somewhere there's some kid on Instagram going, I don't know what that is. Exactly. Um, so throwing in a question from a fan out in chat, holdmyguns.org. They're an organization we support, by the way. Check them out. They're cool. What classes, Scott, are you looking forward to taking in the future? Who are who are you going to train with? Why and what classes? That's a great question, man. So um, I will include one that I that I just took. Right, uh, Bill Blower's uh, Tac Pistol. Uh, Bill Blower's runs Tap Rack Tactical, um, and I'm not just saying that because he's a very good friend of mine. Uh, if his class was crap, you guys got to commend me, man. I haven't sworn once, and that's very hard. For me. We will give very you. Hard. We will give you a variance on. So we yeah. got to. We got to anyway. do a thing between <laughs> swearing and being terribly lewd on the show, but that's okay. all. Okay, all right, fair we, enough. You got to change the time. Yeah, it's it's anyway. dude, it's it's not a dimmer with me. It's a switch, so we'll keep that. Back <laughs> <laughs> uh, to Blau. So, this class. So, so for those people, right? Bill has an amazing thing to teach performance shooting to people that don't want to learn performance shooting. Uh, his class is challenging in every way. Uh, at least the tack pistol one that I took and Bill is one of the funniest individuals on the face of the earth. And, uh, for the audience that doesn't know me, uh, I consider myself to be one of the funniest humans alive. All right. If you don't, yeah, if you don't laugh in my class, uh, you need to check. Your no, that is for that. Is, I will. Yeah, that's for sure. Right. And Bill had me in stitches. Right. But uh, much like my class, the humor is to amplify a point. Mm. Right? And he does an amazing job of that. And he is an amazing shooter. Right. Uh, yeah. So 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 Bill Blowers. Right. Uh, other courses that I'm uh, looking forward to getting into, uh, John Johnston's uh, skills and drills type class. You'll have to forgive me. He'll be out here in August 10th, and I'm taking that class uh, uh, with him. Uh, another just pure performance class, but with more um, 
less than classic targets, B8s, uh, closer distances, wanted squares, things of that nature. Um, I'm looking forward to uh, taking Urban Gunfighter with my friend Dan Brokos of Lead Fawcett Tactical, uh, along with some uh, CQB things, right? And it's not because I want to play Tactical Fantasy Bandcamp, right? It's because I want to push my processing speed uh, where it hasn't been before, right? Uh, for example, right now, there's all these drills out there, and I get them. I appreciate them, right? Some great drills from, like, for example, my friend, uh, you know, Donovan Moore from Point One Tactics, my other buddy, uh, Jared Clausen from Tier One Concealment, uh, Matt Little of uh, Graybeard Actual. And I try them, right? Do I post them? Am I going to work hard on them? Uh, not that some people won't find a lot of value in them, but I'm not learning anything from them other than timing, right? Uh, how to time these things and push them, right? Uh, are they going to push my processor speed? Uh, not really. They're just going to help me learn that drill. Right. Not that for someone who doesn't have those skills wouldn't learn from those things. They absolutely were would. But I already have those skills. Things like uh, room clearing, CQB, fighting in and around cars are not only applicable to me. Right. Uh, as a homeowner with a you know fairly large house, uh, as a person who's in and around cars. Uh, even if I was never in those positions, it will help me be in a area which I am not adept at, and I will make my head my own headlights bigger. So those are the ones I'm I, I'm looking forward to. Uh, as far as competition classes go, I'm uh, I'm looking forward to getting into uh, a class with my buddy Les Kiss Martoni, and again with. Um, Tim Heron. Awesome. Yeah. So that, so that we, we do have a question from the chat while we're on the topic of, of instructors and classes you'd like to take. Uh, again, from holdmyguns.org or holdmyguns.org. Uh, how has Blower's real world career in uh, uh, law enforcement? Blower. That's awesome. It's with Blowers. 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 Pardon me. Blowers. <laughs> blowers. I can't. <laughs> blowers. Blowers. Whatever. It's hey, not my I, fault. Change your damn name. That's um, what I say. Yeah, so how, how has Blower's real-world career in LE SWAT with over 1,500 missions uh -huh. shaped his classes? So yeah. do, do, yeah. do you detect any uh, influence from his mission count uh, in the way that he presents and has structured his classes? 100%. Every single time he goes over one of his drills, he will tell you a mission-related uh applicability as to why he came up with those drills does, does that make sense I don't no know. that that makes perfect sense and uh, i and i think that that hits home because especially in, in today's world you know you you mentioned the instagram yahoos um there there is a bias and i think this is even before the instagram yahoos but there seems to be a bias either for or against instructors that have you know a high xp count or a high xp as, as hold my guns mentioned um you know, that just because you don't have the experience in the real world doesn't mean you're a bad instructor, but I would be disappointed if somebody with that type of experience didn't have that level of influence baked into their curriculum. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Uh, and I hesitate there because that level of disappointment in this industry is exceedingly high yeah right. uh so before i go into bill uh i would like to make a personal uh plea to all of the training students out there your uh look your your money is is hard earned and it should be well spent uh you are taking time away from your family and other and other constructive things that you could be doing not saying that not going to that class is not going to be constructive but if you go to a class where all you get is war stories and supervised drills and you didn't get better please stop saying that that dude's awesome just because he was in dev grew stop stop because he's not showing up to your gunfight 
He's not showing up to your practice session. Mm -hmm. He's not showing up to your match. So stop just saying that guy's a cool guy. So you're a cool guy too because you went to the cool guys class. Stop. And I don't care. I get in trouble for that for, you know, a lot of that, right? But the days of the supervised drills and the cool stories needs to end. Nobody gives a shit. Oh, sorry. That's the score. Sorry. Yeah. Nobody cares. And the floodgates are open, folks. Hide your children. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Stop. Right? Because if you went to a horrible class and posted a review or AAR online, and it was favorable, even though you learned not a thing, right? You are perpetuating a lie and you need to stop. Just stop. Okay. Yeah. Because that instructor won't even remember your name the next time he saw you. That is so very stop. true. So stop. It's it's ridiculous. There's too many amazing instructors out there, right? And that are giving you everything they have to make you better to let those other guys who do supervised drills that demean you in the middle of the thing and actually rejoice when you don't pass their standards. Yeah. Well, bro, you didn't show us anything during the class to help us pass your standards. Ah, oh, whatever, you failed. You suck, I'm awesome. Stop, stop, because they don't care about you. They honestly don't. Too many great instructors out there. Right. Uh, so. Uh, one follow-up question again uh, from our, our our beloved Hold My Guns Org. When you're looking to purchase classes and selecting an instructor, what are some good questions that you as a per, per, uh, possible student should be asking to make sure that your hard-earned money is well spent? I think that's a fantastic yeah. question. G great thing. Can we go back to the Blowers thing? Because I don't want to answer, I don't think oh, I no. answer that in its entirety. Yeah. No, by all means. So, so, so if I can give an example without giving uh, – too, uh, too much of his uh, POI out there, right? Um, he talks about um, the, for example, his thing is if you are shooting, something happens and you're shooting um, uh, weekend only, right? And you need to do a mag change. He doesn't believe in the between the legs. He doesn't believe in the behind the, um, uh, uh, the crook of your knee, all which work, right? But he doesn't want to give up mobility. He says, put it under your armpit and go from there, right? And he tells a story about an individual uh, that, you know, people say, well, if you lose that, you can't do this because you're going to lose all the arm strength. It's like, dude, I've seen dudes that have been shot in their hand and they still try to grab the gun and just put inward pressure on it. So you're not going to lose... Uh, overall strength just because one part of your arm was shot. Um, he talks about reloads. He, he talks about dr the, the uh, importance of a fast draw. He talks about uh, the human decision-making paradigm, right, uh, which is about a quarter of a second and why you need to work to be better than that, but also learn how to modulate from that. So yeah, everything Bill does is based on experience. Nothing is uh, just fluff he pulled out of the sky. Um, what questions do you, do you need to ask an instructor? That's a great question. First of all, if you are going to call uh, or reach out to an instructor and ask them specific questions and they don't reply to you, there's your first sign. If they say, do you know who I am? <laughs> That's your first sign. You're done. Yeah. You're done, right? Because even if they could teach you something, uh, their level of coolness may be over your head, so you may not be able to retain that information. right? <laughs> and let's not forget, this is still a capitalistic endeavor. You are the client. Okay. Right. There's always an interesting dynamic, right? Uh, like in martial arts, right? Or school, college, you know, whatever. And in the firearms industry about who has control, the student or the teacher when the student technically is the client. But if you have, you know, one or two questions about specifically what you can learn in the class and the things that you want to learn and how to get better, 
uh, I think those those questions need to be answered. Be patient, right? It's not like we're at a desk, we're on the range, you know, eight to nine hours a day. So be patient with them. But the um, the availability and the enthusiasm of the instructor to answer your questions is key. Every awesome instructor that I know that I endorse uh, are more than happy to answer those questions. Number two, the questions start with yourself, right? What are you looking to accomplish in the class, right? Most people say, I want to get better. Well, what the hell does that mean? If you got a four second draw and you go to this class and get a 399 draw, well, that's better, but who cares, right? Who yeah, cares? Is it, is it worth that $400 plus dollars you spent? Exactly for a tenth for a hundredth of a second. So define what define what you want, right? If it's just to go hang out with a cool guy, awesome. Pay that money, go there. Don't hit the target. Listen to the cool stories, and then tell your friends. Take a picture, right? <laughs> but if you demonstrably want to get better, define what better is, right? And define why that is, right? Oh, I want a one second draw. Why? Because Instagram? Right. Yep. Right? Hey, I'm, I mean, an, get, I'm an influencer, damn it. Right. I mean, don't get me wrong. I can show you how to do a one second draw. But why? Because if, if you don't have the why, then the ability to practice, to understand how and maintain that one second draw is going to be fleeting. Right? I say this in my classes all the time, and you can ask, you can ask Kent, right? There are few problems out there that cannot be solved with a 1.2 draw. And a 1.2 draw is like significantly easier than a one second, right? But if the answer is, man, I think a one second draw gives me more time to make other choices, right? Uh, and the mechanics of learning how to make a well-aimed, cognizant one second draw to first shot, if I can break that down and listen to the technique, uh, of what it took me to get there, man, I can almost solve any shooting problem by applying those same techniques. Uh, if you haven't thought about it, then think about it, right? And then formulate those questions. And I think once you know the answers to your own questions, finding the instructor that can fill in the skill gaps and the practice gaps becomes much easier. Outstanding. Outstanding. Awesome. Awesome. So we have managed to make it on over an hour and we have not yet talked about any gear. So in the interest of not making this a gear show because software matters more than hardware, that said, good gear Matt, matters. Kit matters. Kit good matters. Gear matters. And, and it absolutely does. It's a lot easier to win a uh, race in a stock car than your Honda Civic, right? Um, talk to us a little bit about what your gear is and what what your gear looks like that well let's start off with let's start off with a metaphor right so if you guys were out buying a car right a high-end car right uh let's say a tesla and you want to take it for a test drive but the seat is too far in but you're looking at the seat of a tesla and you're like this looks like a control panel at Houston launch control. What the hell is going on here? Right. And you ask the sales guy, Hey man, can you help me move the seat back so I can take a test drive more comfortably? And he goes, bro, you need just, you just need to drive more. <laughs> right. What would you say to that guy? Right. You would go, yeah, bro. Have a nice day. See ya. I'm going to the Range Rover dealership, right? But in shooting, when we go, hey, man, I'm a little interested. Like, is this trigger smoother or is this holster less restrictive or this recoil spring or this red dot? 
What, what do we hear all the time on the internet? Hey, bro, forget all that. Just shoot more. Right. Right? I mean, to a point, I get it. Kit doesn't make you better. It removes obstacles. It removes obstacles, right? Uh, one of the biggest thing, I always laugh at people who have like AIWB holsters, right? And when they draw, their crotch line comes to their chin before the gun releases. <laughs> and I'm like, dude, why is your retention so heavy? It's like, hey, man, I got to hold that holster upside down so the gun doesn't come out. And I'm like, well, what's your belt for then? Your belt's a built-in retention device. So now you have all the retentions and you can't do anything. Meanwhile, look at my setup where my retention is there, but it's not nearly as restrictive because of the setup of my holster. And I'm getting my first shot off in 0.85. Meanwhile, you, you're suffering the pain of your wedgie, right? Kit matters, guys. It, it, stop saying it doesn't. Your, you know, your uh, pleather belt that you're holding at, you know, holding your holster, your alien gear holster at four o'clock. Look, dude, it's not retaining anything. Right? It's not holding a solid foundation for your holster so that you can get the gun out efficiently. And when you can't get the gun out efficiently, then you apply frenetic motion, and that makes the draw process harder. Right? So kit matters. Don't go down the don't go down the slippery slope of kit is everything, and you don't need to practice. But it does matter to get squared away. Right? So what was your question? What am I running right now? Well, just in general, what without being too overly specific because some things work better for other people than others, body type, shapes, all that kind of stuff. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll be as specific yeah. as you want me to be. Yeah, let's do this. All right. All right, so this is my Boresight Glock 17, right? Uh, it has, let's go from top to bottom. Uh, I've got uh, Ameriglow backup irons on there with an RMR06. I've got, uh, which is a 3.25 dot. I've got other guns with the one MOA dot that I'm messing with right now. Gen 5, stock barrel. Stock barrel. Yep. Did I say stock barrel? Yep. The aftermarket barrel companies have a lot of work to do before they get better with the accuracy of this Gen 5 stock barrel, right? Uh, moving on. Uh, Surefire X300U. This is a uh, thousand lumen one or whatever it's at right now. Ten thousand lumens. I don't know. It's not the six hundred. It's the really bright one. Okay. Yeah, it's the center of the sun model, right? The, yeah, exactly. Uh, I have the Filster Arc extensions on there. That I have big hands, but man, this just makes it easier to activate, right? With my uh, trigger finger. Uh, the trigger is the super high speed stock edition. Wait, you, you mean you don't run an aftermarket trigger? I do not. I do not. The internals have been polished and uh, deburred by AJ Zito Practical Performance. Um, and if you guys want to listen to Clear Gun Internet, listen to this. Uh, I won't tell you what the poundage is on that because people won't believe me. Um, and it sets off all the primers. Uh, I have the Ambi CAG Works uh, slide release, uh, slide lock slide release uh, for three, four years now. Uh, slide lock has not been part of my life because my grip is so high. This thing has been flawless. So now it is. I don't know what to do with slide lock. It's amazing. Uh, we have the uh, Tau Development Group. Uh, Striker control device, right? What is that for? If I put my thumb back here and press on the trigger, it will not go. It basically turns it into the benefit of a striker fired gun. As I am holstering appendix, if I feel any movement back here, that means there is an obstruction in my holster and I know to back off and see what's going on. Okay. Okay. Uh, that I did not know that existed. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. Tau development group. It's a, it's, it's awesome. Uh, 
down here. Even though I'm generally not a fan of the company, sometimes they do well. Uh, this is a Zev Pro Magwell. Uh, they are one of two companies that makes a uh, Magwell for the Gen 5, where you have the, you know, the stupidest front cutout ever, right? Completely unnecessary. Uh, the front cutout. So this covers that. And so you have a Magwell. Um, what else? Uh, this is uh, the mag release is a what is the extended mag release? I can't remember. It's the mag uh, Gen 5 mag release where it's a little bit extended. But more importantly than that, I have from Rock Your Glock. It is a half power uh, mag release spring. Right. Ooh. So you have, yeah. So you have all these people that press and they can't get it because Gen 4, Gen 5, blah, blah, blah. And I have them give mine a try and they're like, oh, this is amazing. Or they'll go, I got to swing my gun over so I can get all the power on there to make the mag release, you know, the mag release and everything. I'm like, try mine. And they're like, oh, look at that. They're like, oh, look at that. Right. The number of magazines that have fallen out of my gun unexpectedly because I have that half power uh, mag release spring in there is zero. And I don't care if you believe me or not. I shoot more than you. Awesome. So there you go. No, so, that, uh, kid, hell, man, I'm taking notes. I'm <laughs> yeah. uh, all followed up with. Um, the uh uh what should i call it uh filster spotlight holster which carries all that uh i am messing around with the dark star dark wing um uh what should i call it uh uh claw wing whatever you want to call it right and then my own invention of the yoga block uh wedge right that i have invented myself and just as proof that i watch your channel there you go there you go man. <laughs> There you go. Right. Um, and then, yeah, uh, my other holsters have the same thing. For example, I have the uh, uh, the floodlight, right, with the discrete carry concept clips on there. It all depends, you know, uh, if I'm shooting like a 2011 for my buddy AJ Zito or if I'm shooting my SIGs or if I'm shooting my Walter uh, is when I'll use the, the floodlight. But this is pretty much my everyday carry. Um, and there you go. And for everybody with the retention, this is the retention of my holster. Got that? Your belt provides the retention. If you think this is going to bounce out, look, man, I taught a uh, two-day class and then took uh, with my buddy uh, uh, Jason Paletta of uh, GCS Training, and he taught the third day. Basically, at the end of his, uh, his class, we do a wad, right? Uh, we're talking about uh, uh, rope swinging, tire throwing, bag throwing, SWAT barricade, running, yada, 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 right? Over, I think I ran mine in like 175 seconds where you were running back and forth, throwing things over your head. My gun never moved. The gun never moved. You know why? Because my belt is providing the retention. That's what you need. My opinion, discover, discover it on your own. Very cool. That was a... Uh... It was an awesome breakdown, and you probably just sold a whole bunch of shit for people that didn't know what they were looking at. Can I give out some discount codes in case people are wanting to know? Absolutely. Please do that. Right. So if you want to buy something from Filster Holster, P-H-L-S-T-E-R, use Jedi 10. Uh, no CAG works, right? They don't sponsor me. Garrett's a good guy who owns CAG works. Just tell him I sent you. Uh, Vorsight, if you train with me um, and send them a certificate or maybe drop my name, they'll give you 10% on milling and especially the slide work. Uh, the RMR, the light, all that stuff was bought at Big Tech's Outdoors. If you use uh, Jedi 15, it's 15% off over there. Very cool. That works out great. So I'm going to hit you with one final question and then we'll move to our wrap up and, you know, let every, please, when we do the wrap up, tell us all the sponsors, where you're going, all that stuff. But first I'm going to hit you with one more question. Um, this out of the chat again, you've trained with federal, you've trained federal agencies, FBI, HRT, insert awesome acronym here. 
number one, how do you tailor your classes to those different types of clientele, the LE and mill, high end stuff? And number two, have you ever felt intimidated uh, by one of those groups that you were training? Yeah, no, not because I'm awesome, right? So here's the thing that you got to remember, right? And plenty of people have said this, uh, including uh, my very dear friend, Tim Heron, uh, which I use and explain a little bit differently, but it's the same thing. Process, not result. Process, not result. So do I change what I teach, the core of what I teach, if I'm teaching a, a brand new safe shooter, new to the dot versus, uh, you know, uh, LE or high end mill, I do not, right? Because that would mean I'm focusing on the result and I'm abandoning the process. The process is what's got me here. So it doesn't matter if you're if you're a 23 year old girl named Carmen, who's about to go to the sheriff's department, or you are a hardened operator uh, uh, from FBI's NTTU, right? It doesn't, it doesn't matter. What I am teaching is me. And if I try to make something up or change it, uh, one of the things or two are gonna happen, it's gonna come off disingenuous. And I'm gonna stumble on what I'm saying because I'm just making this stuff up as I go along. Right. And if my stuff holds value, then maybe it does hold value for uh, a certain level of person and not another level of person. I have to be mature enough to understand that. Uh, I have been very fortunate that uh, when I was being auditioned for those higher speed units, uh, I stuck to what I know and I got accepted and, and won a contract for, for it. Right. Um, but because of that process, look, speed, oh, I'm sorry, uh, speed comes from efficiency, efficiency comes from technique, right? You couple that with the body works the way the body works. So it doesn't matter if you are, if you are the retiree looking to have a good time whose vision is uh, failing to another guy who has $60,000 white phosphorus panos on his head, right? right? The body works the way the body works. Process, not results. Stick with that. You'll be fine. And through that, if it's not fine, then you want, you maybe learn, understand where you need to get better. Right. Um, I've been very fortunate in that I've got nothing but uh, fantastic feedback um, in, in my classes and things of that nature. Um, and I would offer to students, regardless if you are that high speed operator or that person going to expand your skill set for the first time and you think you may be uh, not the best person there, who cares? Who cares? Because I ain't coming to your gunfight. I might come to your match, right? But I ain't coming to your gunfight. I ain't coming to your practice session. You get everything you possibly can from me, right? Because you are the person that matters, right? If you can't do a drill to my standards, okay. Did you do it better than you could have done it before you came to my class? And you know how you got better. That's the key to mastery. And that's the key on how you get better. Awesome, man. Well, before we uh, give you the chance to hit your wrap up, final thoughts on all that stuff, I just want to say you by far have been one of, if not the better uh, instructors I've trained with. And there's no better compliment I could pay you than to tell you that I would absolutely send any member of my family or friend to uh, come and hit the range with you. And I know that means a lot to you, but for real, guys, if you're going to have the opportunity to go spend your money somewhere, there are other good ones, but you won't go wrong. So uh, hit uh, up. Uh, uh, there was a, a question. There was a question there I want to answer. I just saw this in the chat too, though. Uh, oh, sure. it from, uh, was it from Hold My Guns? Is she probably. Asked, probably. She was probably. calling this the, the no retention holster. Right. Right. Here's the, here, here's the thing, right? 
uh, to clarify that, if I haven't already, right, the retention is a little bit in the holster. I mean, there's drag there, but just a little bit. The retention is coming from my belt, right? So when my belt presses in, it's not going anywhere. Why do I have to multiply it by having retention in the holster plus the belt? See, my hands are my belt now. Make sense? Yeah. Yep. Does that make sense, guys? I hope it does. No, it makes sense. I, I think it's easy to confuse active and passive retention as far as levers, switches, and buttons that make the, make the gun pop out of the safari land versus retention as in the physical act of keeping the shit where it's supposed to stay. Yep. She also wants to know what I eat for breakfast. She does. And I was going to pass that on as a joke, but yep. go ahead. What do you eat for breakfast? Uh, coffee and CrossFit. <laughs> awesome. Coffee and CrossFit. <laughs> That's all right. When you say CrossFit, you got to drink. So I drink. <laughs> no, I'm out of my drink. So I got nothing for you. So yeah. Um, go train with Scott. TJ, what do you got for wrap up, man? Yeah. So first of all, Scott, Jedi, thank you so much for coming on the show. It has been enlightening, enjoyable, and uh, oh so educational, man. You've been a fantastic guest, so we'd love to have you back on uh, sometime in the future. Uh, with that being said, of course, I've got to give my shout out to Ride On Optics. Uh, they are the choice for, uh, optics manufacturer for the Lead Slinger Ginger channel. Head on over to rideonoptics.com. Code T Ramsey will get you 15% at checkout. Also want to give a shout out to Head Down Firearms, uh, makers and manufacturers here locally uh, in Atlanta and Tennessee for some fantastic AR platforms. Head on over to hdfirearms.com and check them out. And lastly, I want to give a shout out to Hold My Guns Org or holdmyguns.org. As you guys know, if you've been following the channel for any length of time, this is a uh, a nonprofit that that, Ch that Kent and I uh, take very seriously. We've had them on the show. Uh, I invite you guys to head on over to their GoFundMe page. I did post a link in the description to this video, uh, and please go donate. Uh, but by all means, feel free to read up on that that organization and their cause. Uh, it really is a fantastic alternative for those going through a hard time uh, to uh, go through and get the help that they need without fear of being labeled or be uh, subject to extreme risk protection orders or any of that other uh, incredibly infringing legislation that's come down recently. Uh, so we really hope to get that off the ground. And uh, it's just, it's a great organization. So I invite you guys to go check that out. Uh, but Kent, that was all I really had, brother. Uh, Jedi again, man. I, it's been fantastic having you. So uh, well, I, 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 I will be training with you here in the near future. I promise you that. Uh, awesome, but man. Kent, why, why don't you take us home, man? Awesome. So Scott, just one last opportunity for you. If you've got shout outs, if you've got uh, sponsors, discount codes, anything you need to throw up, or if there's anything you'd like to leave us with, please do that. And then we'll close it up. Yeah, sure, man. We'll get in some capitalism here. Uh, if you guys yeah. want to follow me or train with me, just, you know, uh, Google modern samurai project. Uh, I'm the only one out there. I think there's some like weird Japanese paper mache dude, but ignore him. Uh, <laughs> that might, that might be me as well. But anyway, uh so you can find me on uh facebook instagram youtube you go to my youtube channel lots of free milk and videos out there to get a little bit better to kind of give you an inkling of what you'll learn in my class as well as long with along with my podcast who i think there's a lot of interesting dudes on there that will help you get better um instagram you know is on there uh going strong i just hit like 14 100 followers or something like that um it's an interesting uh, uh, source of, uh, of the message. So I dig that. Uh, Facebook, um, modernsamuraiproject.com. Click on the classes link, classes link. It'll show you where I'm training uh, and how to sign up for my classes. And uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm pretty approachable, man. If you guys have any questions or anything like that, just send me or the uh, true foundation of Modern Samurai Project which is my wife, Beverly. My email is scott at modern samurai project.com versus Beverly at modern samurai project.com. If you want to host us or find a class near you, man, by all means, just reach out and uh, we will do our best to uh, make you better. For sure. You will. Everybody. Thank you so much for watching. Um, please like, favorite, subscribe, share TJ at let's Sling and ginger Scott at modern samurai project and myself at green mountain defense. God bless, stay safe, and we'll see you on the range. Thanks, everybody. Take care, all.